Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our month long Focus on the Story 2021 International Photo Festival. That was a mouthful. But thank you for joining us all the way from Ireland and DC, New York, all over. We are having a, a really powerful conversation uh, today. I'm really excited about this. I'm fans of both of these women uh, who are we gonna, we're gonna have this conversation with. We have Angel Livas and she, it, when it comes to connecting the hearts of audiences, you must be relatable, transparent, honest, and quite frankly, you have to know what you're talking about. Angel marries her tremendous life experiences with her spiritual compass to guide others through manifesting life on and off the clock. Her direct nature draws audiences, but her keen storytelling captures their attention and provokes them to take action. She's much more than a speaker or a multimedia host. She's a connector, helping everyone draw closer to their dreams. Angel is an international best-selling author, CEO, visionary, and award-winning director of the I Am Black documentary, The Enlightenment. She is also the recipient of the 2019 Communicator Award for the Women Behind the Business Talk Show, which airs on 96.3 FM HD4 in Washington, DC. We also have India Bill. And India is a North Carolina-based artist, curator, and author. Bill's work merges fine arts with social justice. She uses photography and video to reveal the often overlooked and unappreciated experiences unique to people of color. Specifically, Bill's first monograph, Performance Review, brings together work over a 10-year period that highlights the realities and challenges for women of color in the corporate workplace. She lectures about these experiences, which also addresses bias in corporate hiring practices. She is a fellow of the Center for Curatorial Leadership and completed residencies at Harvard Art Museums, the Center for Photography at Woodstock, and McCall Center for Art and Innovation. Bill received grants from the Magnum Foundation and the Open Society Foundation, among others. Welcome, Angel in India. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to have you here with Focus on the Story. And every one of you who have joined us today, thank you. Before we get started, I just want to let the audience know that we will reserve some time for Q&A at the end. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom. Please enter your questions there so that we can see them. And now, Angel, I'm going to turn it over to you and let's get this conversation started. Thank you. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm super excited to um, be here to speak with everybody and to lead this conversation with India. And I want to make sure that everybody is on equal footing when it comes to the amazing works of India Beale. And so in order for us to all have a clear understanding and stand in agreement with what India has created in the performance review, um, I'm going to turn it over to India so that she can introduce her works. And it's made up of, well, actually, I'm gonna let India do it. India, where are you at? Hey, first of all, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here and to be in conversation with Angel. I just truly appreciate it. Um, I actually have a favor to ask of the audience. I saw that Eric was putting the Instagram handles of folks down. And I want everyone to just take like one minute and pick up their phone. And I want you to make sure you're following Focus on the Story. Uh, that's Focus underscore on the Story underscore. Uh, make sure that you're following them. You're following Angel. Follow us on Instagram because it's one thing to come here and hear these conversations. It's another thing to uplift the platforms that allow these conversations to take place, right? So let's just take all of like two seconds and just make sure you're following Angel, following Focus on the Story. Follow us on Instagram. Uplift these individuals so we can continue to have these type of conversations um, in the world. Um, please so follow I'm, India. She oh, yeah. right. her name in there. Please <laughs> follow India. You have to. So I wanted to ask the audience really quickly, um, does anybody know what happened in this video? 
and you can write it in the chat uh, if you have an idea of what happened. Uh, and I'll wait just like a minute if you have if you all know what happened in the video. Right, let's see if anybody has any any suggestions. If not, I'll, I may or may not tell you, Angel, and I will definitely get into conversation about it. I know the black women know what happened. Yeah, well, I think somebody said, wait, they touched my hair? Wait a minute, wait, it sounds like they let you feel your, what? Are y'all serious? <laughs> it was it was something like that. Um, this kind of was the first project back in 2010 um, that I did with my white male coworkers. Uh, a rumor started at my job that the white men were fascinated with my hair. Uh, now I was working in uh, IT um, at Yale as a graduate student. And so I would come in and get my assignments and I would leave. And, uh, and so, that, so this, this video is based on that rumor uh, from my white male colleagues about their fascination with my hair and their desire to know what it felt like. And so Angel and I will get into the conversation in terms of how the work evolved, uh, but that was one of the first bodies of work I made um, in the beginning when I first started making it. And in the beginning is actually my mouth uh, talking. And so again, thinking about your own insecurities, your own experiences and how that shapes the foundation for the work you make. So I won't spoil it, but I will tell you um, eventually what happened in that video. So yeah, it's a little, a little, a little sneak peek of the work that I made for sure. A little teaser, a little teaser. And I think it's the perfect, um, lead into my first question for you. Um, for those who aren't that familiar with your work, and even those who are, um, I would say that it's definitely on the helm of diversity, inclusion, equity, and per a conversation with you, relationships. Why is that so important as part of your storytelling? Well, you know, initially when I made this work, it had nothing to do with DE&I, right? <laughs> It was just my own insecurities and frustrations of being the only black person in the office. Um, I was an artist. I felt like I was doing this kind of like anthropological study, right? <laughs> like literally in a cubicle, it's just something you don't really see an artist in. And so finding myself, you know, you wanna make money, I'm working at this job. And then I realized, you know, walking up the elevator that I was the only black woman on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, this work really had, like I said, it, it evolved to become a conversation about DEI and R, but really in all honesty, the foundation was just my own, um, you know, idea of wanting to be seen as a human being and not as an object. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of the, the foundation of the work um, for I think many, I'm um, generalizing, but many women of color within corporate spaces, yeah. And so your book, performance review is a compilation of, let's say it's what, five different series, correct? Yeah, yeah. What was the genesis for each of the series that you compiled into performance review? Right, so I think, you know, um, with, I never thought about the work in a book form. So each body of work was just a continuation. I think as an artist and a maker, you make one body of work and maybe that's in the world. And then you're like, well, you know what? Um, this body of work has been really well received. Maybe there's more to be said of this. And I never in the beginning thought I'd be working on the same project for 10 years, but I realized um, as, as an art historian, as an artist, that the stories of women of color within art were limited. Um, that's fine arts and photojournalism. And I hadn't seen a body of work that talked about black women at their jobs, right? Like, what does that look like? And so for me, it was about creating stories uh, that had never been seen before. And maybe they'd been seen in other, in other ways, like a white woman's story or a black, a white man's story, right? Or even a black man for that, for that matter. But for me, it was like, you know, I made this one body of work based on my own personal experiences, but then I realized there was more to be told in terms of each uh, body of work that was created. Okay, so from that though, right? A lot of artists don't always have the financials to back their creative vision. Um, I feel like many artists, many, many creatives, it's like they have these big ideas, these big dreams, and then they get stuck because they're like, okay, well, who's gonna finance this? Or what grant is gonna come along to make this possible? What was your story? Um, so I would say that, you know, for me, 
so I made I made this kind of um, officing video, and that was during my graduate study at Yale. So that was a grad school project. And then I found myself at, at a residency called the Center for Photography at Woodstock. Eric, if you could put that in the chat, that'd be important, right? Um, CPW, the Center for Photography at Woodstock, is a residency designed for only artists of color. Now, people may ask, why is there a residency in the United States that's designed for only artists of color? Because the art world is this big. And artists of color in the art world, well, I can't even make my finger that small, but it's like, it's like this big, right? And so the idea is that CPW gives artists of color a platform to have a voice. You know, we talk about financing, right? But first you have to have the platform in order to, to garner the exposure that is needed in order to be able to finance your work. And so if you don't have the platform, then how do you even start to think about financing that work? So CPW knows this and they create platforms for artists to have that exposure, the time, the resources, all the things you need within a residency. And so during that residency, I made uh, the work called Can I Touch It? Uh, where I gave white women traditionally black hairstyles and asked them to take corporate portraits. Um, I really wanted to talk about these ideas of conformity, um, having to alter oneself to fit into a space that was never designed for black women to thrive in the first place. And so for me, taking these white ladies, mostly boomers, and giving them these traditionally black hairstyles and having them take these portraits, um, it was a way to, uh, to expose certain truths. You know, mm -hmm. if I allow these women to be the other for the moment, then in many ways, it could talk about something greater. And CPW gave me that platform. Um, that work went viral. Um, it was shared on Facebook over 500,000 times. And from there, it allowed me to think about grants and residencies and other opportunities because they gave me the platform to be able to expose my work to the world. Um, so that's one way. I think for every artist, it's going to be a different journey, but that's one way of doing it. Okay. Now, because we, I do want to, we're going to break down each of these things. And I know you just went into <laughs> the one a little bit in depth, but your book, you said that your publisher did something very unique and had a different and unique way and approach to um, publishing. Even, you know, before you could even sign, you had to put in some work. Talk to us a little bit about what that process was, was like for you. Definitely. So uh, my book is published by Michelle Dunmarsh. Marsh. Uh, Minor Matters is the name of the book. Eric, if you could put that in the link. Oh, there you go. He's like reading my mind. There you go. So, uh, so Michelle Dunmarsh uh, is the publisher, owner of, co-owner of Minor Matters. Um, and this is actually, she's a woman of color, which is important because there are not that many uh, women of color who are in the publishing, who've been there. I mean, Michelle has over 30 years of experience uh, publishing a variety of artists of color. And so for me, it was important to uh, work with someone who believed in me more than I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And shout out to Michelle when she's in the audience, but um, I actually didn't, um, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about a book. And after the work got all of this national attention, Michelle was the only publisher that came to me and said, you should think about a book. Now you think your work is all over these magazines, the New York Times, National Geographic, Huffington Post, all these places. Um, but there was only one publisher, one woman of color, that came to me and said, your book, your work deserves to be in book form. Now, Michelle's model is very interesting in the sense that with her, with her model, you have to sell as a, as a photographer signing on, you have to sell 500 pre-sales of your book uh, before the book is even published. And so if you don't hit that 500 pre-sale number, um, the book will not be published. Right. And so what that does is it allows the artist not to have to front the money, $20,000 to get your book made. Right. And so the pre-sale money is actually used to actually make the book. So the publisher doesn't lose any money. The artist doesn't have to put that money up forward. And so the book is still made through the pre-sales of the book. And uh, when I signed the contract with Michelle, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was literally in like February of 2020 when the whole world shut down and I had to sell 500 copies of my book, right? And so there was a moment, I kid you not, so, and I had until May to do it, okay? And at that moment, I, um, I asked myself, how can I ask someone to buy my book when people are losing their jobs? 
when people don't even know how they're going to make it, like, how do I ask someone to buy a book? And for a month, literally from February to like mid-March, I didn't try to promote the book because I felt guilty. I felt like there were more important things in the world than my voice. And, uh, and I, I, you know, it's funny. I was, I was surfing on Instagram. <laughs> and you know how you do when you're like surfing on Instagram. And I ended up on Megan the Stallion's uh, Instagram page, random, right? And I'm sitting there and her song with Beyonce literally went platinum. I mean, you know, she sold all of these copies. And I said to myself, if Megan Thee Stallion and Beyonce can sell all of these copies of this song about dancing, I can sell a book about the experiences of Black women at work, right? So I literally, you know, you know, and even Michelle was like, listen, your, your voice needs to be heard in the world, you know? Like, don't devalue that. And I think as an artist, we have our own insecurities. And, uh, and so we started selling the book. I mean, I was like calling old booze, boyfriends, like you used to love me, right? Like, can you buy this book for me? <laughs> like literally, and I kid you not, we sold more than, um, we hit the number by May, we hit 500 books. And, and I think for me, um, it was humbling to see that people wanted it. Like had never seen the book, didn't know what the book looked like, but had enough faith in my voice, had enough faith in the work to say, I'm gonna spend this $60 on you and I'm gonna bring this in the world because I feel like it's important. I think for many artists, it's just, you know, like I said, it's humbling to have that, um, that level of support that maybe you didn't even think was there, yeah. And so I love this story for a couple of different reasons. One, you never know where your inspiration is gonna spark. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. who would have thought that yeah. being on the next Italian's page, you're gonna be like, like I got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I think the other part is, is that we often doubt ourselves. We, we often sometimes take on the weight and the responsibility of others. We're really, if we stay in our lane and stay true to what we know is our truth and our purpose, then everything else will fall in alignment. So I'm grateful that you had that boost of encouragement because it's not like this book is $10. Right. It's $50 plus shipping, which brings it to 60. Yeah. So if people and you were able to get over 500 people to come to, to support and put the money where their mouth was and you did the work too. And I wanna just make sure that people understand like, yo, like you can't just throw something up online and say, hey, is there for the world? Can you support it? You put in work, you got on the phone, you cold called, you did what you needed to do to make sure that your book got published. So congratulations to you for that in the midst of a pandemic. All right, now let's go into, um, am I what you're looking for? As I was going through that series, um, the one thing that I noticed, and um, can you first, am I what you're looking for? Can you give a little background? Um, I'll say this, it's a compilation of women um, from going through it. They were all women under the age of 30. And it was their book, I mean, their photograph alongside a quote or a message from them. One, what was the reasoning behind selecting women under 30 to make up, am I what you're looking for? Totally. And I'm actually going to, because I think we need some visuals. So I want to show you guys the book. So you'll see the series that Angel's talking about. So mm -hmm. this is Diana from the Am I What You're Looking For series. Uh, and here's the quote that goes beside it. Um, and it was important for me even making the book. Um, and I feel like the book itself is its own work of art, right? Mm -hmm. So even though there was a lot of work over this 10 year period, making the book was literally its own baby, right? Like uh, outside of just the other bodies of work. Um, I used to work at an HBCU. Uh, can someone please in the chat write what an HBCU is for the people who don't know? Uh, Historically Black know. College and University. <laughs> Some people don't know. Uh, there you go, there you go. Some people don't know about HBCUs and that's okay, right? But you need to know. Um, and uh, in North Carolina, where I'm based right now, actually has the most HBCUs in the country. So we have like seven or eight HBCUs here. So I was working at Winston-Salem State University and my students were coming to me not to talk about their classes, not to talk about what happened on the yard. They were calling to talk, they were coming to talk about their interviews. 
You see, many of them were seniors, they were graduating and they were going into their jobs. And so, you know, Professor Beal, I went to this interview and someone asked me, you know, is that my real hair? Or I went to this interview and someone asked me, how many children do I have and how old are they? Or I went to this interview and someone asked me, you know, you speak so well, can you tell me why you're so competent? Or I went to this interview and someone, you know, asked me if I, would, if I wouldn't mind going by a different name because my name is difficult to pronounce. And so I realized that my students were going through the same things that my mother went through, mm. that my grandmother went through, that I went through working in corporate spaces. And so my work stems from my own personal experiences. And when my students and I were sitting in the office, looking at one another, realizing that nothing had changed, I said, well, why don't we make some work together? And so every woman in this book um, are either students of mine or student of, or people who were referred to me through my students. Um, each quote are the woman's experiences in terms of what they think about corporate spaces and what they envision them to be. Um, you know, I photographed them all in the home they grew up in. So they're not models. It was important for me for them to feel comfortable. And I mm -hmm. said, well, home usually is the space where you feel the most comfort. So uh, Magnum Foundation funded this work. I drove all over North Carolina, little towns I never heard of to biggest cities. I said, tell your mom, we're moving the couch out the way. And I photographed them. The backdrop that you see in that series, which I'll show you, uh, the backdrop is actually the hallway I walked down at Yale. The same, someone, same hallway where you heard the voices of the men um, feeling uncomfortable. And so you'll see this kind of hallway backdrop. And this is the same one I walked down where I was a spectacle where I was other, right? And so um, the women are standing in front of that same hallway. And I said, you know, I want you to wear whatever you deem professional. I'm not gonna dictate that. And I want you to pretend you're the only woman. You're the only person of color. You walk out the elevator and that's all, you don't see anyone who looks like you. How would you feel in that moment? And uh, the beautiful thing about all 30 of these photographs is that each woman had a different perspective. And if you, once, once you buy the book and, uh, and see uh, the photographs, you'll notice that each woman has a different story but they're talking about human things, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I feel like the natural progression based on what you just said um, leads us into mock interview. Yes. And um, with mock interview, you essentially posed um, a question to Black women between the ages of what? 27 and 58, and you asked them all, you, you asked those same questions that these Black women were asked during interviews um, to white men between the ages of 20 and 23. And I found the responses from the white men to be quite <laughs> interesting. Um, but I also felt like they were able to say things that most black people wouldn't even say. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, um, and so I wanted to know from you, What's the most uncomfortable question you've been asked in the workplace? Um, you know, I think uh, as a, for me personally, as a woman of color, we, we are, I am comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, even being at Yale, I was the only black person in the entire program, you know? Uh, and I think that over the years, you get so, you get a little seasoned, like the women in nine to five, for instance, right? You get seasoned in the questions that are, that are posed to you. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe initially, I think when I was younger, I used to get upset, right? Like you get, but I think at that point, I didn't, I hadn't had much control over my feelings. And I think that was the honest truth. And then as I got older, I realized um, the best ways to handle those type of things diplomatically, right? And I think that, um, you know, going to like a Yale or, or even at Harvard for that matter, um, I think that a lot of times people are, um, they don't understand, like they look at your resume and they look at you and they're like, you know, how is that possible, you know? And uh, I think for me, in terms of levels of discomfort, I found myself having to over-explain. Does that make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Over-explaining certain things. And, and I, I to these, and these days I don't refuse, like I'm not, I'm just not gonna do it, right? But, um, but earlier on in my career, I did find myself having to over-explain my education, having to over-explain uh, certain awards, having to over-explain how those things were possible. And uh, at first you think, well, maybe they just want more information, right? Like maybe they need more detail. Try to give them the benefit of exactly. the doubt. Exactly. <laughs> and you realize like, wait a minute, this has nothing coming to me. This has nothing 
even do a detail. This has everything to do with the way I look. And yeah. um, and yeah, and it's more than that. So so I would say there's not one, I mean, we would be here for hours if I list all the questions that have been asked of me, you know. Um, I think that overall, I think a lot of those questions had to be geared towards um, you know, levels of success and the the melanin in my skin. So one of the things that I noticed, and this is actually a little later, but you kind of hit on this, is on the token Black person, right? And when I think of the token Black person, I often also associate it, unfortunately, with a level of responsibility of informing others of the very things like somebody, you know, rubbing their hair, like at the roots of your head, you know? just so they can understand and have, um, I don't know, like, do you feel like after completing this 10 year process that that's also one of the things that kind of still is um, important that black people, the, the token black people where they're the only ones in their workspace, that they kind of have a responsibility to share and enlighten or inform or teach or do you feel like it's everybody's independent responsibility to understand and to learn? Well, definitely the latter. You know, I don't think it's anybody's, um, especially person of color's um, uh, role to be the educator, right? I think the one thing that's wonderful about performance review for me is that there are white men, uh, there are white women, there are black women in this book. Right. And so these white men, you mentioned performance review, allow me to make them the other for just a moment. Like mm -hmm. these men knew that they're going to be asked questions that black women had been asked. However, like a traditional interview, they didn't know the questions in advance. And I remember meeting with the guys before we shot it because I knew there was going to be levels of discomfort that would take place in the shooting of the video. And one white guy said, well, what if I say something stupid? And the other guy said, I think that's the point. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> the idea is that. Um, we're talking about human experiences, mm -hmm. you know? and if you don't see me as a human, then you won't respect me as a colleague. If you don't see me as a human, you won't see me as a friend, as a mother, as a sister. You won't see me as any of those, any of those things. And so I think that using, in many ways using, because I think photography has a certain degree of exploitation, using white women and white men to talk about something greater than themselves right? We talk about true allies. What is an ally? An ally is someone who bonds themselves to you. Literally, they are bonded to you. If they look at the definition of ally, it means to bond to one person, right? But if you're mm -hmm. going to be my ally, then you're literally going to bond with me, meaning mm -hmm. you're going to walk in my shoes. And these individuals, these white women, you know, they didn't like those hairstyles. No, hell no, they didn't like those hairstyles. But, you, but it wasn't about the hairstyle, right? Right. That wasn't the point. The point is, is that they allow me to make them the other, again, to talk about something greater than themselves. And so I think that all of us um, are on our own kind of, I guess, diversity maturity. We're all at different stages of that. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the work, I hope that people are able to see a little bit of themselves, even a small amount, um, in order to uh, understand the experiences of women of color in those spaces. So I'm going to go back to where, how we started which was around diversity and inclusion, equity and um, relationships. And I'm going back there because of what you just said. And I feel like photography can connect to the hearts of people better than a PowerPoint can if you're sitting in a meeting trying to explain what diversity means, what inclusion means, what equity means, and relationship. And I know the relationship entity is something that you feel is important. Can you talk to us a little bit about why the relationship aspect is so important? Right, so um, so over the years, I've done um, a lot of, I guess, DE&I training. So I took some courses, and really for me, that was just getting some research involved. You know, when you're making a book, you think about research and development and things like that. And so um, at that point, um, I realized that artwork was doing more than, you know, you, like I was making this work, it was my own personal experiences, but then I realized having done research that the artwork was actually doing even more um, than, uh, than I had even anticipated myself. And I think as a maker that just happens if you're open to the possibilities of whatever, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so um, from that, from that moment, um, I decided to think about what does it mean to be connected to someone? What does it mean to be an ally to someone, right? Well, you can have diversity, you can have equity, and you can have inclusion, but there is no relationships, right? Like if you are not connected to one another, if you don't if you don't vibe with one another, if you're not listening to one another and hearing one another, then what's the point of everything else? Mm -hmm. You know, like we can be diverse, but if you don't talk to me, then what's, you know? So for me, the relationships as an artist coming in is the connector. It's what glues it all together. And so the artwork in itself is all about relationships, right? Those guys in my office doing that, that video, we, we, we ended up being closer. When you make something together, it can bring you together in a way that you've never imagined. And so at that moment, it was about being able to connect with one another. And that's where the R comes in, in terms of building those relationships, connecting with one another, and being able to grow from that experience. Yeah. And so I think that's a perfect segue to talking about what that series is called, and it is known as the office scene, correct? And in that scene, there were eight white men that rose to the challenge to do something that a lot of people probably would love to do, but don't have the audacity to even ask to do. <laughs> so do you want to share with us what was happening in that oh, video yeah. that we saw earlier? <laughs> uh, so, so like I said, basically, um, I was a graduate student and a rumor um, I was started at my job that my white male colleagues were fascinated with my hair uh, so much they wanted to know what it felt like. And I remember talking to my white female supervisor. She said, you know, India, I was talking to Paul the other day and he loves your hair. And I was like, really? She's like, yes. I mean, he loves it so much. He wants to know what it feels like. Now, mind you, Paul didn't even know my name, right? Let alone <laughs> the idea that he's having this conversation about touching me. Um, as a woman of color, I felt uncomfortable. I did. I felt seriously uncomfortable. Um, but as an artist, I was intrigued. I said, well, how can I join this conversation? How can I be a part of this dialogue? So we set up two cameras in the middle of the office and I asked each man to participate in an art project. I said, I want you to touch my hair. Um, surprisingly, no one said no. <laughs> Everybody wanted to participate. Uh, we filmed the whole thing, like literally a camera in front of me, a camera behind me. Um, and each man took their turn and I would say, you know, I want you to touch it and they touch it. I was like, I want you to touch it harder and they touch it harder. I was like, harder than that. And they pull it a little harder, you know. And then um, I came back a week later and I interviewed them. And I said, you know, how was it? How did you- You said it like that, India? Oh, oh, just like how that. was it? Oh, just like that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, because obviously if you're trying to touch me, you're trying to touch me, right? So, uh, so you know, we don't, we have to think about the levels of sexuality that are involved in that as well. And, uh, and so the men were, um, they were uncomfortable. You know, they were talking to me. It's one thing to have an experience and then go home and, you know, they probably went home and were like, oh my gosh, like, why did I do that? You know, uh, I think one man said his hands felt shiny. Like, how do your hands feel shiny, right? Like, you know, uh, so... Uh, but for me, it was about making the comfortable uncomfortable. You know, I knew they were going to be, and I, and I wanted them to be. And so uh, they talked to me, and there was levels of discomfort in their, in their voice. And I knew that was going to happen. And so um, afterwards, the guys and I, we talked about the work. We talked about what it felt like to be objectified. I explained what I was doing, extremely transparent. And for many of them, um, they never had a reason to think about it, nor a reason to care. What mm -hmm. happens when you make the comfortable uncomfortable? What happens when you reverse that power dynamic uh, in many ways? And so now, you know, many people ask me, well, you know, how is the relationship with you and the men now? Uh, you know, they support, they share it on, you know, Instagram. They bought the book. <laughs> they buy the book, right? Um, but like I said, you know, when you make something together, that project you know, however many people may think about, however people think about it, it opened the conversation, right? It allowed us to have a dialogue about what it feels like to be a Black woman in that space. And, uh, and from there, the projects just kind of continued because I realized there was more um, to be told. Yeah. All right. So I know it's time for me to start winding down to Q&A. Um, 
so I don't know if there's questions yet, but I do want to get to these last two really quickly. No, go ahead, Angel. Okay, cool. So can I touch it? Now, I would have thought that the men, hands in the hair would be the can I touch it. But the can I touch it was actually the ethnic hairstyles that were done on the white women. What were you hoping to convey and what did you learn from that particular series? Definitely. And I'm going to show it to you guys so you can see it. I want to show this too, because um, we may get a chance and questions maybe about process um, with the video work, especially how do you translate that to a book? And that was one of the challenges that my publisher and I had to walk through. So I did want to show you guys this. Uh, so this is office scene. And so there again, uh, we decided to make it full bleed. Uh, because we wanted to have that kind of film experience uh, with the work. And so that way you had, an, um, it, it, it gave it that sense. And even with works like this, the Can I Touch It? Um, leaving this blank space was intentional. Um, I was a gallery director for over seven years. And so I wanted the photo book to feel like you're walking in a gallery where you have the photograph and then you have the wall text. And so this is just a version, the idea of the photograph and maybe even a blank wall as you're walking the corner to the gallery. And then you'll have the two photographs on separate pages to allow individuals to really feel um, each photograph. Uh, now these women, uh, some of them were my coworkers um, and some of them were referred to me. Um, and so, like I said, women were more, more forthcoming with their comments as women can be. And they would ask me things like, girl, how'd your hair get like that? Or can my hair do that? Or can I touch it, right? And they were all in my space. And so I said, you know what? I can get this to you. Like, I can do this for you. I can give you this look. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes. However, I want you to take a corporate portrait. And they asked me, well, why a corporate portrait? I said, because, you know, when I go to interviews with my Afro, I never get the job. Never, mm. ever. People seem I'm a militant or political before I even open my mouth. And so I want to question conformity. Now, I knew if I chose a younger white woman, it wouldn't have the same impact, right? Mm. Because you see white women with hairstyles, you know, cornrows and things like that, right? Um, so I was intentional in choosing people, boomers, um, who probably would never even think of having a hairstyle like that, right? Um, and like I said, there was levels of discomfort for the women even having changed their hairstyle. I made them quote unquote the other for a moment. And in that moment, they had their own thoughts and perspectives. Many hated the hairstyles. But like I said, I could care less whether or not they liked the hairstyles. The point was, is that when you become the other for a moment and maybe lose a sense of who you are, right? Then there's a level of empathy and understanding that can take place in the work that is made. So, 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 you know, there's a certain degree of humor to all the work I made, because I think when you're talking about things as serious as discrimination, employment discrimination, um, you know, social justice, uh, for me, the humor just allows the pill to go down a little easier. If I can make you laugh. So I would say none of these women would say this is a flattering photograph of them, right? But that wasn't the point, right? Um, you laugh a little bit and then you realize there's more um, to it than just, than just what is seen. Now let's jump to nine to five really quickly. Um, nine to five was a compilation video of black women talking about what I would say being the only, kind of going back to what I had asked about or earlier about the token black person. Um, explain to me how that was spliced up and how you were able, this was where I was going to translate the question of process, translate that from video form into book form. Yeah, so I'll show it to you so people can see it. And um, this is actually my mama and my cousin Kelly. So you'll see them right here. Um, I recruited a lot of my, my mother has nine siblings, 12 kids and all, right? So I have a lot of aunts. And I just remember them telling me these stories of being in the office and what happened to them at work. But see, what happens is a lot of times as women or women of color, I'm generalizing, we may tell stories about these experiences to our family, to our friends, to our lovers, right? But we don't talk about it outside of our own circle. And so I remember all these stories that my mom told me, that my cousin told me about discrimination, prejudice at work, right? And, uh, and so I decided to start with my mother. She told me her story first. 
And then I started recruiting other women and I interviewed, I think like 10 or 17 women. And from that moment, I realized there were, their stories were all similar. It didn't matter whether they were in healthcare, banking, they were literally finishing each other's sentences. And, mm-hmm. um, and so putting them together was pretty easy. Uh, they were, it was organic, you know, despite where they were. And so everything wasn't so much about being a token because some of the women worked in predominantly black spaces. So a lot of it had to do with just being a woman in that space. Right. And so all the women were coming from different, different experiences. But the thing that was great about it is these women are seasoned in their experiences, unlike the am I what you're looking for, but these women are young. And so having these kind of seasoned veterans who've overcome adversity, many of these women were vice presidents, owners of their own businesses. They said, you know, this is what I went through and this is how I made it through. And so pulling those stories together, um, you know, really, really uh, was an easier process than I thought. Love it. Well, we have three questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Cherise um, so that she can reach out to the audience and address the questions that have been asked. Cherise. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, India. So we have a question from Ryan. He first says, thank you, India and Angel, for taking this time out to educate. (laughs) And as a white cis man, what is one way to demonstrate allyship, bonding to women of color, colleagues in the workplace, even and especially when it makes us uncomfortable. Totally. Well, I th- I love the fact, Ryan. First of all, thank you for your question. I love the fact that you're thinking about levels of uh, of discomfort, right? I think a lot of times in those spaces we grow, even for myself, um, in ways that maybe you hadn't imagined. Um, you know, Angel talked about this R when we think about relationships, right? And building those relationships. I'm a mom. I have two kids. I'm a sister, I like sports. There are certain things that you can think about in terms of relationships. And so I would encourage you to build relationships with people who maybe are different than you, right? Even if you feel uncomfortable in those moments, you're gonna learn something about yourself. You know, a lot of times um, I'm spiritually talk about mustard seeds of health, but mustard seeds of faith. So a mustard seed is like the smallest seed, supposedly one of the smallest seeds Mm -hmm. in the world, right? And so I want you to think about mustard seeds of similarity, okay? That means the smallest thing, the most smallest genuine thing you can think about in order to connect to someone on a human level, okay? So think about that when you're meeting someone, how can I connect with that person? I, you know, maybe y'all like the same sports. That's why sports are so great because it transcends race, right? People are just thinking about their team, but building those relationships. And from that, you'll be able to build more. But I would say first, form the relationship, right? Reach out and build those relationships first and then everything else will fall into place. Very good. Yeah, that was, um, so Ryan, I hope that was helpful. I think that- (laughs) I think India dropped some, some <laughs> gems, you know, with that one. So most definitely. Uh, so let's go to the next question. We have SD who asked, have you kept up with the former, and I said students, but I think they mean the subjects that you photographed, you know, for your project and what has their experience been in the workplace since then? Yes. So yes, 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 and yes. Uh, each woman uh, received a copy of the book. Uh, that's important to me. Each person I photograph, um, I also try to give them a copy of the photograph. Um, that's just an exchange that takes place um, in terms of photographing someone. And if they didn't get a photograph, they definitely received a book. Uh, many of those women have gone on and had babies and they're in the world and they're, they're you know, they're doing their thing. And, um, you know, I think that women have had a mixture of experiences. Um, they talk about this work. Like, so for instance, one student that I photographed. She's now getting her law degree at Wake Forest, um, but she also went to Howard. And when she interviewed, um, they asked her uh, about experiences that she had that were just like different, right? That was a part of the interview questions in terms of growth. And and she mentioned this work, right? She mentioned being a part of it. She mentioned the platform of of being vulnerable uh, and showing her authentic self and, and being able to think about experiences greater than herself. And so, so I don't call them subjects. Um, in many ways, I'm more interested in the relationships that I deal with the people I photograph than the actual photograph itself. That's just a byproduct of the time we spend together, a documentation of it. That's all that is, right? Um, so, so yeah, we, we definitely, I definitely connect with most of the people I photograph, yeah. 
Nice. I have a question that's related to that. In the work that you did with the Can I Touch It and the white women getting the black hairstyles, did they not have a mirror where they couldn't, did they see themselves like once it was finished, they couldn't see themselves throughout the process or could, was there like a mirror where they could see what was going on or was it like a big reveal like, oh. Yeah, so no, there was no mirror. I mean, you know, see, we're shooting in the middle of like nowhere New York, right? So we're like in Woodstock, New York, which is amazing, uh, but it's not like in the city, right? And so um, many of the women came, we went to the salon, they got their hair done. I told the stylist what to give them. So I'm like, I want you to do like finger waves with the waterfalls and the bun in the back, right? <laughs> like hairstyles that I had back in the nineties, those hard pale <laughs> hairstyles that you have to sleep like this, you know? Like the black women in the audience know what I'm talking about, right? So I had those hairs, you know, you don't want to squish your curls. I, you know, so I gave them those hairstyles and then I had them take these portraits. Now at the time, I had just graduated from grad school. So I didn't even know the level of feedback we were going to receive, right? So when Slate Magazine came and said they wanted to publish these, I was like, oh, well maybe, you know, I'll give them my personal Facebook link. You know, maybe somebody want to hit me up. And uh, it went viral. Like literally three days, my life changed, right? I mean, I received over 2000 messages from women all over the world. India, Korea, Africa, Germany. It was like crazy. And I think even the ladies were like, oh my gosh, like people were like, I saw you on uh, the Huffington Post. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? You know, so I think all of us were surprised by the level of feedback we received. And the idea is that I never knew that something so personal, my own personal thoughts, right, could be universally translated in a way that I'd never imagined. And so, you know, I think from there, um, you know, the women saw the photographs for the first time. So they didn't really see them until they saw them. And then the whole world <laughs> saw them, you know? So, uh, yeah, they were all very surprised, when I, in, including myself, right? Yeah. Um, when we had that level of, uh, of, um, of I guess, uh, of exposure. For sure. Nice. Yeah. Well, we have a, let me see if we can uh, squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, one we have from Corinne and... Hi, um, India, this was briefly talked about, but could you expand more on the additional process of adding video into the work? Um, as artists, they of, it often involves this now and how, as an artist, I guess for them, it involves that now. And they want to know how does photography inform your film work? Totally, so, um, you know, as a photographer, and I'm assuming Karen might be a photographer, um, you know, as a photographer, we start to understand the limitations of our medium. There are limits to every medium, whether that's painting, a sculpture, a graphic design, there are limitations to it. And one of the limitations is you have this two-dimensional object that doesn't speak, right? It doesn't say a word. And so I realized um, as an, and I use artist and photographer interchangeably, as an artist, I start to think about, well, what's the best way to execute a thought? And is that an installation? Um, is that actually video or film? And so I wanted my subjects, quote unquote, friends, for people who use the term subjects, I wanted my colleagues to have a voice because I was muting them. And there's a certain degree of bias, even as a photographer that exists in what we decide to shoot, right? There's a certain degree of exploitation that happens in our process, in our work. And so for me to kind of balance this level of exploitation and bias that happens on even my own part, I wanted to actually hear the individuals I was photographing. And so that's where the video comes into play. And so I think as a maker, it's, it's important for us not to just marry to one thing and think that's it. Like for instance, Hank Willis Thomas, an amazing artist. If you don't know his work, please check him out. Um, he uses sculpture, he uses installations. He uses, you know, you start to think about how you can grow and evolve in your practice. And maybe photography is the entry point, but then those photographs become installations and going into a real life space that someone is walking through, right? So thinking about the evolution of your practice and how you're able to use various mediums in order to get your point across in the message that you're trying to say. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a good segue into our last question. I'm gonna squeeze in here from our friend, Jamie from Memento Workshops. And Jamie's question is, are there any other artists or creatives that you are really enjoying these days or that you seek out to find information, inspiration? So I, how long, this is Jamie? 
Jamie has the question. I don't even know if we have enough time, Jamie. To like, <laughs> I would say, you know, right now, um, more than ever, um, artists of color, specifically photographers of color, are getting the exposure that they've always deserved. Okay, uh, and this is now more than the history of art that has ever existed. And so um, there are, I mean, anywhere from Latoya Ruby Frazier to Hannah Price to, um, you know, who else? Uh, Lorna Simpson, Renee Cox, uh, you know, we can go down the list of, and I'm naming a lot of black female photographers as well, because you have to understand the history of black women in photography is still being written, okay? Like it's still being written. There's only a few books that exist in the world that talk about, other than performance review, right? Like, you know, there's only a few books that exist in the world. And for me to know that even my book now exists in the Library of Congress um, is everything, right? Because I know there's only a handful of books that, that actually exist. And so I would encourage you, if you search Latoya Ruby Frazier in Google or Google an artist, you're gonna go down a rabbit hole of all the artists that you should be looking at and thinking about. And so I would say, I encourage you to do that. Um, but like I said, right now, more than ever, um, artists like Jordan Castile or Derek Adams or, um, I mean, there's so many to name um, who are who are Eli Reed, you know, Charles H. White. I mean, all these amazing, <laughs> all these amazing artists, you know, who who deserve the exposure. And I would say even go back to like James Van Der Zee, right? Like oh, yeah. that these artists are now getting the exposure that they've always deserved over decades and decades of work that's been made. So I encourage you all to go out there and do your research. For sure. Thank you for that, India. And so I just, we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to thank Angel and India, and I'm going to come back to you, but I just want to remind people to check out the Focus on the Story website. The link will be in the chat. Focus on the Story is now accepting proposals for its inaugural 2021 Emerging Storytellers Grant which is aimed at helping a visual storyteller begin and complete a community-driven project that tells a compelling and impactful visual story. You can find more details on the website, but I just wanna call your attention to it because the deadline, the closing date is next week. It's June 18th by 5 p.m. Eastern. So, and the award is $2,000 and also a Fujifilm X-T4 and an XF 18 to 55 millimeter f 2.8 variable lens so definitely check that out i also want to call your attention to some great events that we have tomorrow we have the middle east institute arts and culture center presents migrations in perpetuity Yemeni voices from the diaspora with a talk with Yemeni contemporary artists using photography and video to reflect on migration. Please register for that. That's at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then we have um, Tamron presents in the studio with Jonathan Thorpe, a talk on how to create a look that's right out of the movies. And that's at 7 p.m. Eastern. So please make sure to go online and register for those great events. I again wanna thank Angel and India for joining us and for this inspiring conversation, making the comfortable uncomfortable, um, that is powerful. And I also think as storytellers, that is something that can really be transformative. So thank you for your powerful work, India. Thank you, Angel. And I just want to close out with any parting words. Angel, I'll start with you, like what you're up to next or any parting words you want to leave us with? No, because I know we're right at the time. Um, so I want to make sure I'm respectful of that. But I want to just piggyback off of what India said when we first started. If you guys enjoyed this conversation and you guys want to stay connected, please be sure not to end it here. Just because we end at 8 o'clock, follow us on social media. Um, we will definitely like have great content to share with you. India? Um, I just wanna, again, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be a part of this amazing uh, conversation. It was it's such an honor to, you know, I always wanna, I love working with you guys. So um, thank you again. Um, definitely there's a link for the book. We're almost sold out of the first edition. So if you are interested in buying this book, I would say go on there right now and get it before it's gone. Uh, there will be a second edition of the book. Um, but this first edition, this with, with the voices of Whitney Richardson, 
um, who's an amazing um, writer, photo editor at the New York Times, uh, David Walker from, um, from PDN, um, even Becky Harlan from National Geographic. There's so many different amazing stories that are in this book, amazing writers of the forward. So like I said, if you're interested, get it now because it's almost gone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Focus guys. on the story. Check it out.